-hmm. where we engage our mind, our perspective about women. We're working towards a new, a whole new world of social reform. So on this program, we'll be discussing gender. We usually discuss gender equality or gender justice in our societies. Our conversations usually cover sexual gender-based violence, identifying root causes, and seeking ways to address that and related issues by harnessing healthy and generally acceptable traditional values, systems, and practices healthy religious values and practices as well as practical global values and systems for women and girls equal rights. We hope that such conversations will contribute to changing mindset and attitude about women and girls human rights and lead to a shift in our culture of impunity. So we talk about women education and empowerment, women achievement, women advancement, um, domestic violence issue, rape, sexual abuse, harassment, resources, and support. We're trying together to build a community to celebrate, to support, and inform each other about women and their contribution in our world. Hence, a new day on Focus on Liberia. Today, speaking with us on a new day is Susan E. Lindsay. Susie is the author of Liberty Brought Us Here. This is it. Liberty Brought Us Here. You need to get a copy. So Liberty Brought Us Here, the true story of American slaves who migrated to Liberia. A meticulously researched book that tells the compelling story of the major and Harlem families who migrated to Liberia in 1836. Her book also explores the motives of those who supported colonization and the roles of women in the colonization movement. She is a former member of the Liberian Studies Association and was invited to speak at the LSA conferences in 2015 in 2021. Her article, All My Heavy Afflictions, Black and White Women in the Colonization of Liberia, appears in volume 45 of the Liberian Studies Journal. Today, Susan writes, recorded history tends to focus on the accomplishments and experiences of men. And some of us know that. Recorded history tends to focus on the accomplishments and experiences of men, usually white men. They were the ones who typically had the time and education to write history. And it is far easier for historians to find documentation of men's life, which perpetuates the idea that only men make history, but women, Black and white played significant roles too. So in this presentation, Susan E. Lindsay, author of Liberty Brought Us Here, the book that I just showed you, The True Story of American Slaves Who Migrated to Liberia. She's going to be exploring with us uh, the role of black and white women in the colonization and early history of, of Liberia. Thank you for joining us, Susan. I am so delighted to have you. Thank you. I am so thrilled to be invited. I feel like I've known you a long time through Facebook and through other connections. And so it's just so nice to see your face and talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, just if you want to give us a little background or go into a uh, um, why you decided uh, to, you know, to research this that you're going to be pre presenting on. Mm -hmm. Why did you, I, I, and, and like I mentioned, we all know, or at least some of us know, not a lot of people, some of us know that men were the writers because they were educated. Yes. There was a point in time, women weren't allowed to go to school or to be educated yes. to some extent. 
um, to some certain level. So men wrote history, so they wrote only their accounts. Why now did you sit down and be like, you know what, I'm going to look for, you know, I'm sure there are contributions that women made. Someone just needs to put in their time and their resources and energy to dig those stories out or those accounts out. Why you decided to do that? Um, well, when I started researching this book generally, um, I noticed early on that most of what I was uncovering was about the men. Um, and the, the books were written by men and the news articles were written by men and the journal articles were written by men. And uh, I found that a little bit frustrating. Um, I come from a family of strong women and I knew uh, just because these women went there, there was courage involved just in that act. And so I knew there had to be more to their story I actually applied to the Kentucky Foundation for Women for a special grant to do the research uh, for this piece of that book. And when I started out, and I think I shared this with you before, I wasn't sure how much I would find. I wasn't sure I would find enough information for a book. And, uh, and I was pleased, the research took about six years. <laughs> so, um, but I was happy with what I found that being said, I, and I, I'll talk about this toward the end of my presentation, I think more research needs to be done in this area. I think there still are stories to uncover. And um, if there are women researchers out there who'd like to take a stab at this, you know, I think the bibliography that's in my book is a good starting point uh, because I really do think there's more out there. The places where I found the stories of the women tended to be in things like letters, news articles, some of those more informal um, records from history rather than the official historical accounts. So, so with that being said, um, I'll jump into it if that's okay. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, sure. okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to talk today, as, as, as Priscilla said, about the role that women played in the colonization movement in the United States, as well as in the early history of Liberia. And we've talked already about how recorded history tends to focus on those accomplishments of men. One of the challenges in, in researching women is that, of course, Traditionally, women have changed their names when they married, so it's very hard to track them. And often you would have, you know, Mr. John Smith and his wife and children and, and the, the women and daughters were never mentioned by name. So it does make it challenging. Um, and the other piece of it is that in the 19th century, of course, white men held virtually all of the official positions of power in the United States and initially in Liberia. But women, black and white women, found ways to exert their power and make a difference. Sometimes that was through traditional roles within their families or in schools and churches where women are particularly powerful and through extensive correspondence and advocacy efforts. And I firmly believe their contributions need to be recognized and recorded and remembered. I agree. Um, I think this is how we inspire the next generation. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. So some of the women I'm going to talk about today uh, include a woman named Amelia Roberts, who came to Liberia as a widow with her children. And many of her children would go on to become very influential in Liberia's history. A woman named Harriet Graves Waring. She was a freeborn Black woman who migrated in 1824 and her daughter, who was named Jane Rose Waring. These, those women were black, but there were white women who contributed to the colonization as well. I'm going to talk about some of them, including Emily Thomas Tubman, a descendant of some of the people that she freed would become a Liberian president. Uh, there are women who led quieter lives, lives that weren't as public. And one of them was Eliza Hatter. Uh, and I wanted to tell these stories too, these women that were sort of invisible. So Eliza had been enslaved. 
Uh, she ended up becoming a teacher and opening a school in Liberia. And Agnes Harlan, the woman whose story is told in my book. But before I jump too far into that, I wanted to give a little bit of background about the status of slavery at that time in the United States okay. and a little bit of the history of the colonization movement to kind of put it, their stories into perspective. Okay. So by the early 1800s, slavery was very embedded in America's culture and economy. Slave co codes controlled the status and treatment of enslaved people and the rights of slave owners. Enslaved people couldn't own property. They couldn't enter into legal contracts. They could not testify against white people in court. They could not legally marry. They could not physically defend themselves if they were attacked and they could not vote. They could not gather unless a white person was present. They could not associate with free black people and they weren't allowed to leave their owner's property without permission. In almost all the Southern states, laws prohibited them from learning to read and write. Now by 1808, the United States had banned the importation of enslaved people. So no new slaves were coming in. Now that's not quite true because some, there were some that were still smuggled in illegally, but generally the importation of slaves stopped in 1808. And the Northern states of course, had of course abolished slavery, but it continued in the South. And any, the law at that time said that any child born to an enslaved woman became a slave from birth. So the number of enslaved people grew, even though more weren't being imported, it grew through the birth of these children. But at the same time, the number of free black people in the United States also grew. By 1820, there were about 230,000 free black people in the United States. And this occurred because some owners were freeing, deciding to free their enslaved people. And there were some slaves who purchased their own freedom. But freedom um, wasn't perhaps the paradise they had hoped for. It had its own set of problems. Yeah. There were laws yeah. called black codes that dictated where free black people could live and work, curtailed their rights and restricted who they could associate with. Though free, they were not equal to white people under the law. And in fact, they faced many of the same restrictions that constrained the lives of the enslaved people. Safe, yeah. You know, so really, um, one writer described it as being betwixt and between, between you know, yeah. freedom and, and because they weren't, they were free, but they weren't equal. They were, yeah. I read yeah. that in your book. <laughs> and in the United States at this time, um, emotions ran high over slavery. Um, the people who opposed it and the people who supported it used all kinds of arguments about it, including arguments based in theology, economics, morality, and the rights of states to govern themselves. Yeah. But even those people who wanted to end slavery couldn't agree on how to do it. No. So there were some who supported a scheme of what was called gradual emancipation, which was basically freeing enslaved people one at a time. There were others who supported the idea of immediate and complete abolition of slavery across the land. So making it illegal all over the United States. But very few white people at the time, even those who were zealous abolitionists, supported very few of them supported equal rights for black people. And many, perhaps most white people at the time, believed that white people and free black people could not peacefully live together. So the idea of called the colonization movement came out of this situation. And the idea behind it was to help free black people migrate somewhere else where they could live freer lives. Um, there were a lot of different reasons why people supported it. And some of them were pretty noble reasons and some of them were pretty bad reasons. But for decades, colonization was a common topic of discussion in parlors and on front porches. This was not something that was um, sort of a, a last minute idea or a half baked idea. This was something that was really considered for quite a while before it was put into action. Newspapers reported on these discussions. Editors vigorously debated the pros and cons. And Americans discussed colonization in houses of worship and in both houses of Congress. 
Finally, in the last days of 1816, it was right at the end of December in 1816, a group of white men, many of whom were slave owners, met in Washington, D.C., and they formed the American Colonization Society. Now, I want to point out this group was a private organization from the start. This was not a government department. It was not a government program or a government agency. Hmm. Their stated purpose was, quote, to promote and execute a plan for colonizing with their consent, the free people of color residing in our country, in Africa or such other places as Congress shall deem most expedient. The phrase with their consent was part of the original founding documents. And throughout its history, the American Colonization Society emphasized voluntary immigration. They, they did not want to be deporting or exiling people. Now, many white people supported colonization, as I said, for a lot of different reasons. And many white people opposed it. And likewise, some black people, including freeborn and formerly enslaved people, supported colonization and others opposed it. I, the, I, I'm go ahead. sorry. I know we have said you go ahead to the end before I ask questions. <laughs> I just can't yeah. resist in, in throwing this in to say that people say, and I got a part where they are with their consent, mm -hmm. but yet they were making um, freedom conditioned upon the fact that you had to leave. That, that there were states, you're right in that there were states and counties that required that. In some states, you could not free people unless they left and went somewhere else. Now, it didn't have to be Liberia. They could have gone to a northern state or somewhere else. Okay. But those were laws passed within the states and, and counties or cities. It was not the colonization society itself that was making that requirement. And there were some owners who said to their enslaved people, I will free you, but only if you go to Liberia. Yeah. So, so it wasn't the colonization society making that condition, but yes, that did sometimes happen. So, okay. um, but the, as I said, the society started in 1816. It lasted almost a century, which shocked me until 1913. And the Colonization Society and its affiliates, all together, about 16,000 Black people left the United States to start new lives in Liberia. That's a lot. Um, yeah. As far as my research goes, I've not been able to discover any other out-migration out of the United States that was any larger. Now, somebody okay. told me they thought there was one that was larger, but I've not been able to find proof of that. Yeah. And in the first, those first two decades of colonization, almost half of those immigrants were women or girls, 45%. And many of the adult women were widows or single mothers. Yeah. That's a big, big step to take, to go to another country and take your children. Um, I think it took a lot of courage. So um, I wanted to talk just real briefly about the role that um, the, the lives that enslaved black women would have had at the time. They typically had very hard lives. They worked from dawn till dusk. Uh, one historian outlined the typical responsibilities this way. Slaves worked in the kitchens and smokehouses to produce three meals a day, except perhaps on Sunday and to hang and smoke innumerable pounds of pork. Slaves waited on tables, slaves washed and ironed, took up and put down carpets, carried the huge steaming pots for the preservation of fruit, lifted barrels in which cucumbers soaked in brine, pried open the barrels of, the, of flour, swept the floors and dusted furniture, hoed and weeded gardens, collected eggs from poultry, spun and wove and sewed household linens and, quote, Negro clothes. One historian theorized that free Black women may have seen colonization in Liberia as a means of empowerment, an opportunity for autonomy and independence. They would have welcomed the broader rights that were afforded to them in Liberia, rights they would not have had in the U.S. even if they were free. In Liberia, single women were eligible for land grants, 
and the 1847 Constitution protected women's properties from their husbands' creditors. So these women knew, probably knew, that going to this new land would be hard, but at least they would be working for themselves and for yeah. their families. They weren't going to be working for someone else. So the first woman I want to talk about is a woman named Amelia Roberts. Now, she was frequently described as a light mulatto. She was born in 1789, probably in Virginia. She gave birth to seven children. Their father's identity is not known, but Jenkins is the middle name of six of her seven children. That kind of gives a hint of perhaps who their father was. Um, Amelia, so this is the, this is um, not Amelia's picture. <laughs> um, we'll come to this lady in a minute. Uh, okay. Amelia married a free black businessman and boatman named James Roberts. But by 1829, she had been widowed. And as I said, she had seven children, 40 years old, had seven children, Sailed to Liberia by herself with her kids. Well, not, you know, she was on a ship full of people, but didn't have a spouse with her. And uh, they sailed aboard the Harriet, the ship called the Harriet. Amelia was, quote, distinguished for her hospitality. And I think she must have been an extraordinary mother. I think she must have done something very right because three of her sons became prominent in Liberian history. Joseph Jenkins Roberts, as you probably know, became the first president of the Republic. Her son, Henry, returned to the United States and got a medical education and then came back to practice in Liberia. And her son, John, became the bishop of the Liberian Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church. So she was probably a pretty remarkable woman, I think. Um, the next woman is Harriet Graves Waring. And um, what I'll do, um, Priscilla, is just tell you when I have photos, um, images, and, and then you'll know when to put them up. Harriet Graves Waring was born in 1796 in Norfolk, Virginia. And when she was 17, she married a man named Colston Waring, and he was a free black man. The family moved to Petersburg, Virginia. And Colston was asked by his Baptist congregation to go check out Liberia in 1823. That was very early in the colonization movement. And people mm -hmm. had heard about it, but they wanted somebody else to go and be on the ground and check it out and come back and report. Mm -hmm. So he did return and reported favorably on the colony. And as a result, nearly 100 free people from Petersburg, Virginia, migrated to Liberia. Harriet, Colston, and their six children were among those immigrants aboard the Cyrus when it sailed for Monrovia in 1824. By 1835, though, Colston and two of the couple's children had died. In March 1835, Harriet sat down and wrote a letter to a colonization official telling him of her family's plight. You have heard ere this of the death of my husband, Mr. Waring, he died the 12th August last, and while I communicated to you the mournful tidings, my heart yet bleeds. Yes, sir, I am a widow with four small children. I do not, however, mourn as one without hope. I feel thankful to God who has declared himself a father of the fatherless and the widow's stay. He has supported me in all my heavy afflictions and trials. So clearly a woman of strong faith. Um, she remained in Liberia. She did remarry in 1839, and her new husband was a man named Nathaniel Brander. He had been a Colonization Society agent, and he later served as a Liberian Supreme Court Justice and then the first vice president of Liberia. So one of, Harriet Rose, one of Harriet's daughters was Jane Rose Waring, and I do have an image of her. Uh, Jane, there's a picture of her. Jane Rose Waring um, was just four years old when she went to Liberia with her parents. Do you want me to put her picture there now? Yeah, go ahead and put that up. Um, Jane ended up meeting, marrying Joseph Jenkins Roberts in 1836 after his first wife died. And when he became, he held a number of different positions in the colony and, as I said, became president in 1848. And so she became Liberia's first first lady and she fulfilled the different duties related to supporting him and his positions. 
1848, the couple went on diplomatic trips to America and England, and she accompanied him. She was known to speak French. She was described as a well-bred and refined woman, a beautiful and interesting woman, and a thorough lady. So again, I think um, she was put in a position perhaps that she had never had any training or experience for, and, and sounds like she did an excellent job. This next yep. woman I'm gonna talk about is Martha Harris Ricks, and I have an image of her as well, if you wanna put it up. Now, I love Martha's picture. There's just something about her face that she, she looks very like a very sweet person, a kind person, but also there's a, a hint of a little bit of mischief there. <laughs> she was born into slavery in Tennessee and migrated to Liberia in 1830. She and her husband, a man named Sion Harris, prospered in the colony. And when Joseph Jenkins Roberts and Jane Roberts went to England and America, she accompanied them. She and her husband went with them. Later, her husband died. He was struck and killed by a bolt of lightning. Martha ended up marrying again, and she married a man named Henry Ricks. So some of you probably know that last name, Ricks. The her Ricks Institute. Her new brother-in-law was Moses Ricks, who donated the land for the Ricks Institute. Okay. But Martha uh, was sort of an independent businesswoman. She farmed and raised turkeys, ducks, and sheep. She was a lifelong advocate for agriculture and industry in Liberia. She was also an inventor. She invented a new kind of weaving loom. And she was able to exhibit some of the things she made at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893 in the U.S. Martha particularly admired Queen Victoria, perhaps because England was the first country to recognize uh, the Republic of Liberia. So Martha spent 25 years making an applique quilt for the Queen that depicted the Liberian coffee tree in full bloom. When Martha was an elderly woman, she traveled to England and there, with the aid of the Liberian ambassador, she was able to gain an audience with the queen and presented her with the quilt. Yeah. Now, the story of Martha giving the quilt to the queen has sometimes been disputed, but a news article about this exchange appeared in the Liberian Gazette Monrovia in September of 1892, and that was reprinted from the London Daily Graphic of July 1892. So that was a, a contemporary account and it included a photo of Martha Ricks. So I think the account is probably true. That, that seemed to me to lend a lot of credibility to that story. So um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about a woman who's not as well known, Eliza Hatter. I don't have a photo of her. Eliza was 21 years old um, when she came to Liberia. She had been born into slavery but then freed by her owner, a Virginia woman named Christian Blackburn. But before Mrs. Blackburn freed her, she taught her, trained her as a school teacher, clearly taught her to read and write. Um, Mrs. Blackburn also purchased Eliza's husband, a man named Reuben Hatter, from another owner so that the two people, the couple, could go to Liberia together. Yeah. No, and that's... when you think of the, the value of a male slave at that time, that was a significant investment in money for her to do that. They hmm. arrived in Monrovia aboard the Carolinian in 1830. Now, there was a man named William Innes who wrote a very early Liberian history. And in his book, he notes one of the females sent out by Ms. Blackburn had a pretty good library, infant school boards, and he meant slates, you know, to write on etc. And it is believed that on her arrival, she may open a small school. After two years in the colony, Eliza wrote to her sister and said, I never was better satisfied in my life. If I only had my dear relations and friends with me, we enjoy the same liberty here our masters and mistresses do in America. My husband left me in the pack at Richmond the last of, last, the last of December. He went out as a steward. So in other words, he, he had taken a job aboard a ship. That same day, Eliza wrote to her former owner. When Mr. Hatter returns, he intends to build a stone house. She meant to, mentioned that she lived in a very pretty part of town and she had a beach nearby on which she took morning and afternoon walks. 
Mm-hmm. Now, Eliza's husband returned to Virginia to the harm, home of his former owner and apparently did some work there. He indicated he wanted to return to Liberia, but never did. I'm not sure why. Eliza died of what was labeled decline when she was 36 years old. And that same year, Reuben applied for his Seaman Protection Certificate in Philadelphia. So that indicates to me he was going to continue a life at sea. Agnes Harlan is the woman that I write about in my book, um, she and her family. She was formerly enslaved in Kentucky. Her husband was a man named Enoch, and he had been born into slavery, but was freed in 1825. And he and Agnes together had seven children, five sons and two daughters. But Enoch died sometime between 1831 and 1836, when Agnes and her children sailed for Liberia. Now her oldest son- A single mother of seven children. Yes. Yeah, and to bring all those children all that way and, you know, stepping into the unknown. It really was a leap of faith. Her oldest son, Louis, um, I am sure she was counting on him to be a help with her. Yeah. Uh, but he died of malaria within just a few months, two or three months oh, after arriving. By 1851, three more of her sons were dead. So four of her five sons mm-hmm. Her daughters did survive. They went on to marry two men who were also new settlers in Liberia. And Agnes's sole surviving son, John Wesley Harlan, became a minister in the Methodist Episcopal Church. He also became a member of the Liberian House of Representatives, representing Grand Bassett County. So I think, again, Agnes must have been a, a, a pretty strong individual, but also a pretty influential mother with her children. So these women who stepped aboard these Liberian bound ships made great sacrifices. They often paid a heavy price. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's important to remember that even though they were of African descent, they were not African. They had been born and raised in the United States as had their parents and very likely their grandparents and maybe even great grandparents. They left behind all that they knew and yeah. often left behind people they loved. And, and you and I talked about this a little earlier, that some women were married to men on different plantations and could, they, they wouldn't be freed. And so they came without their spouses or so sometimes without their children because their children were still enslaved. They traveled to this country. They knew nothing about. They didn't speak the languages. They didn't know the land and the plants and the animals. And in this country, they faced multiple dangers, including malaria and death by other causes and poverty. One of the things that just broke my heart was to learn that on average, malaria killed one of every five immigrants in their first year after they arrived. Mm -hmm. One out of every five, That's, that's very sad. And yet these women made a real impact on Liberia as mothers and spouses of important men They made diplomatic and social contributions, but they also contributed on their own. Thank you for for saying that. No, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't just in their role as uh, in their relationship to others, but also in their own lives, you know, in terms of education, agriculture, industry, healthcare, and really forming the foundations of a new settlement, of a new society for these settlers. because I think whenever there is a new society, a new community, I think it is women who are the civilizing force. Um, and, and I think these women filled that role. Um, and that's not, to, that's not to dismiss or ignore the civilizations that were already there, but this new culture of these settlers, I think they, they formed that, um, contributed that role. Now, even though the stories of these particular women and some others have survived, most female migrants to Liberia lived and labored and died in obscurity. You know, surviving in that new country was was really hard. And it was especially difficult for women who didn't have a partner with them, but who often had these very large families. And sometimes, you know, by the dint of hard work and good luck, they survived and built new lives. 
but often they and their children lived in poverty and, and died without leaving a trace of their existence. And before you move on, I want you to zero in on um, why it was difficult for women with our male partners. I know I, I read it, but I just want you to, because, you know, they needed males, your male partner maybe to start a land or um, dig or cut trees or build a heart or Yeah, it, it was... Um, the way that the colonization society worked was the, the settlers got a, a certain amount of land that they were assigned. They drew lo literally drew lots for the land. And so sometimes they got really good land. Sometimes they didn't. But in order to keep that land, they had to clear a certain portion of it and build a home. Uh, within it's a specific time, time frame. Yeah. And if they didn't do that, then the land reverted ACS back to the back. colonization society. And yeah. so, you know, clearing out, clearing the land was physically hard work. Building a home was physically hard work. Often their homes were burned down, either in fires from cooking or sometimes some of the indigenous people didn't welcome them there. Um, and, and just planting crops, clearing land enough to plant crops. And so doing that on your own as a woman with children, very often very young children. I mean, some of these kids were two, three years old, you know, when they came to Liberia. So the, the very young children not only couldn't help very much, but needed care themselves. So it was a lot. It was a lot to ask. Um, and, and yet they, these, there were these women who did this. And I, I think it's just remarkable. Um, yeah. Some of them did remarry, but... Of course, at that time, they didn't have family planning options. And so remarrying typically meant having more children. And if you yeah. already had many children, there were women, I think, who chose not to remarry because of that, um, because they they had enough, you know, to take care of. So hmm. um, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you, Susan. Okay. okay. I know I read that, but I just wanted you to explain that for the audience. Okay, you know, okay. The of the land, yeah, they needed male partners. Because most of the work was physical. Yeah, it, yeah, it was physical. And, and even those who weren't farming, if they were subsiding on hunting game or if they were subsiding by fishing, I mean, it's still, typically they were very physical activities. Yeah. And I think um, that's difficult particularly if you didn't have a lot of physical strength. And some of the women probably did and, and were fine. And I think others perhaps struggled some. So I wanna talk a little bit about the roles that, that now that white women played. Um, okay. Very few of them went to Africa, um, but they played critical roles in that colonization movement in the United States. So again, a little bit of background on these women. Um, any of you who have seen the movie Gone with the Wind or read the novel Gone with the Wind uh, or other films and novels about plantation life, the wives of plantation owners and daughters are typically presented as these models of purity and perfection wearing hoop skirts, you know. But that image um, is, is really more fable than fact. Uh, these women carried out critical and complex functions that contributed greatly to the financial success and social success of their husbands. Their responsibilities typically included oversight of food production, including gardens, orchards, dairies, and smokehouses, housekeeping, quilting, sewing, weaving, making pillows and feather beds, producing candles and soap, preserving meat and vegetables, providing hospitality to visitors, brewing home remedies, caring for sick and injured, attending deathbeds and births, handling family correspondence and, and household finances, and when their husbands traveled, providing oversight of the whole plantation and crops. Having enslaved people did not relieve them of all the hands-on work. They were also isolated on these very large rural properties, you know, often hundreds or thousands of acres. Your nearest neighbor was quite a ways away. As we noted earlier, most of them um, were denied the education that their male children got. Um, they either had no schooling or their schooling focused on, you know, 
learning how to embroider and maybe studying French and playing the piano. They, you know, they didn't have the education that the boy children had. So Susan, um, um, again, we're talking, now we're talking about mistresses and wives or slaves owners. Yes. Okay, and, right. and their daughters. Yeah. And their and, daughters. Uh, yeah. So, um, so we're on white women mainly. Now. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Mm -hmm. And they were, um, discouraged from being involved in politics or current affairs. They, that it was sort of, that was a thing for men to do and women weren't supposed to be thinking about that. Um, they weren't allowed to travel without chaperones, which limited their mobility and increased their isolation. Almost and like they, in what is happening in other, in some Arab countries now. Yes. I mean, what, I know, what I, was happening and women yeah. were allowed to drive on their own. And I it, thought of yeah. that too. Um, yeah that it's a it's a means of control yeah you know when when women can't think for themselves and go anywhere on their own and america yeah. has evolved to some extent from that point that you're talking about now in mm -hmm. history it, it sounds like going back to that time because now they're taking away women autonomy to their body and interfering with women reproductive health but yeah, yeah. let's just <laughs> <laughs> like, I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I think it's a scary time in U.S. politics, but that's a, for another topic. But yeah. yes, I agree with you. Um, these women also typically had very large families. I read somewhere that at that time, it was common for a couple to assume they would lose half of their children before adulthood. And so they typically had families that were 10, 11, 12 children. And they were expected to take in orphans from their family if other relatives died or unmarried female relatives. So these households were typically very big. Um, and not all but many plantation mistresses were also exposed every single day to evidence in the form of mixed race children that their sons or husbands were sexually assaulting black women. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot that they could do about it. They, you know, they didn't have the power to stop them. Now, the constraints and restrictions on the lives of these white women cannot be compared, of course, to those born by enslaved people. And I'm not trying to say that they were equal. But those restrictions on their lives are relevant. Um, they had few legal, those women had few legal rights, and they lacked independence and a political voice. They had limited educations, experience, and perspectives, very little free time, a lot of responsibility, and almost no control or power to make decisions. The wife of a slave owner was as completely under his control as were his enslaved people. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was surprised to learn that although 90% of all slave owners were men in the United States, 21% of those who emancipated and colonized enslaved people were female. Women were also more likely to engage in multiple acts of manumission, freeing people, and they typically freed a greater proportion of their enslaved people. Hmm. Hmm. So, Can you go first, over that again? You want me to say it again? Yeah, that, um, mm -hmm. so more, there were more males in owners of enslaved people? Yes. 90% of all slave owners were men. Were males. But women were more likely to free when they yes. were. Yep. And that was after their, their husbands died or something and they inherited. Sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, there were circumstances where you might have a married woman whose father died and specifically left slaves to her. And so she had legal control over them. Okay. That wasn't typical, but it did happen sometimes. Or a woman who might have entered a marriage already owning enslaved people. Um, but clearly, the husbands typically controlled those things. Um, but yes, women say, were, were like twice as likely to do this as men were. Okay. So, so the first woman here I want to talk about is Emily Thomas Tubman. And we have an image of her. Emily was yes, born in Virginia do. in 1794, but she grew up in Kentucky. She actually grew up um, 
not too far from where I lived in Kentucky. I lived there about 20 years and she lived in Frankfort, Kentucky. Her father died when she was fairly young and Henry Clay became her guardian. Now, Henry Clay um, was a pretty famous man in both Kentucky history and U.S. history. He held a number of important positions of power. He was known as the great compromiser. And he would go on to lead the American Colonization Society for many, many years. Now, in 1818, on a trip to Georgia, Emily met and married an Englishman named Richard Tubman. He was 28 years older than she was. The couple lived in Georgia, and Richard owned several indigo, tobacco, and cotton plantations, which meant he also owned many enslaved people. When he died, his last wish was that Emily free them. She was determined to fulfill her promise to him, but Georgia lawmakers had made it illegal for slave owners to free slaves if they remained in the state. So Emily offered her enslaved people a choice. She would free them and pay for their passage to Liberia, or they could remain enslaved and stay with her, but she would treat them as though they were free and she would pay them a wage for their labor. So she wrote to a colonization society official asking for some advice on which Liberian settlement would be best. And in this letter she wrote, health is of a paramount importance Next to that, the greatest prospect of comfort and success in business. I am anxious for them to go as soon as possible. Two or three of the number declined to be liberated, having preferred to remain as they are. They may, however, think differently when they see others starting. I think this family will be quite an acquisition to Liberia. The older ones are skilled in business. They are honest, industrious, and not an intemperate one among them. So in the end, more than 40 Tubman settlers agreed to go, and they arrived on the African coast in the summer of 1837 aboard the Baltimore, and they settled in the Maryland colony. Two of the enslaved people Emily Freed were a married couple named Sylvia and William Shadrach Tubman, and their grandson, William Tubman, would go on to become president in 1944. Wow. So that's, you know, you think this woman... Um, this white woman who never stepped foot in Africa made this decision that made a difference in Africa's history. Yeah, um, and it, it was in it was a little. She had to do a, a lot more behind the scene because I read where she was trying to get um, this uh, ACS member. Was he an ACS member or someone? Yes. To give her to be able to present to her enslaved people what Liberia looks like, you know, they set the, the settlements so that I think that was a way to convince them to say, hey, you know, life is there or something. But she wanted them to make informed decisions. And so she she tried writing him and then he wouldn't he wouldn't show up and she tried a couple of times. So she had to she had to go to DC herself from Kentucky after she wrote. Uh, um, and she had to go to DC herself to be able to meet these uh, um, ACS um, agents and say, "Hey, I've been trying to get some advice uh, so that I can be able to inform, you know, my people, so that they can be able to decide whether they want to stay with me, enslaved, or um, they want to relocate to the to to, to Liberia." And like Susan said, and then she said. I'm not going to keep them as enslaved people. I'm going to pay them and treat them uh, as free people. But then um, I don't want to go into all of Susan's presentation, but she ended up dealing with um, the colonization society that was uh, working directly with Maryland set uh, settlement because um, I think the group that was dealing with um, that, that were in New York or something, um, they were dealing with Monovia settlement or Basako. And she just got, she, she became impatient with them. And so she started dealing with um, 
with I, I didn't want to go on deep into your presentation so i'm sounding like i'm not sure to give you the chance to be able to explain that so i was still, i was still talking about emily the the effort she made at the point where she became impatient and she had to go can you hear me susan okay um maybe dennis we should take a break now while susan try to go in and out Okay. Yeah, she's back. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I can't yeah, hear you. Yeah, are you um. <laughs> so I was talking about Emily, how she ran out of patience, and then she decided not to continue with the first group. Um, and then she, that's how her enslaved people ended up in Maryland instead of, was it in, in Monovia or in Basako? Uh, I, hang on just a minute. Yeah. Okay. Can, can you hear this annoying noise in the background? I, yeah. I, I am so it. sorry. It's the fine. other computer, the other laptop I was using, the battery died and it I, I plugged it in, but it's not working. So I'm trying to use my own. Um, let me try something real quickly here. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to turn that down a little and just speak louder. And it, it I'm hoping it will stop. So I'm so sorry. That's okay, fine. go ahead and repeat your question. No, no, no. I was I was um talking about Emily. Um yes. how she she wrote and then she ended up traveling to DC. Yes. Yeah, she she spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this, how to fulfill this promise that she had made. Oh, okay. And um, she wrote to people. She went to Washington, D.C. Her brother um, was an attorney, and so she sought his advice. And finally, she ended up, instead of working with the American Colonization Society, exactly. she worked with the Maryland one. Mar and that exactly. was why, how she finally was able to, uh, get, you know, get her um, her people to, my, to uh, Liberia. So. so I think that's why the Tutmans came from that end. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I think so too. Liberia, from Hang on just a second. I want to check my power system, make sure this one doesn't crash. Hang on. Okay. In the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and read some comments. Um, I hope you can hear me, even though you're not on right now, but I hope you can hear me. So um, oh, let me see the beginning. Okay. All right, I'm back. Okay. I was going to read some comments. Do you want me to do that? Okay. Uh, Honorable William K. Clay Senior say he's watching from Maryland. Thank you, Honorable Clay. Anita say what a strong woman when you were talking about um, yeah the women who migrated and had to do it all on their own. Yeah. Yes. Um, Thank you, Anita, for your um, contribution. She said, as a black African woman, I see Jane as a white woman, and yet she was not. Uh, I think Jane is the mother, was no, the first first lady. Yes, and and her mother um, was mixed race. And so, and and I think actually Joseph Jenkins Roberts was, was pretty white skinned too. He had a, a lot of white parent, uh, white ancestry. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anita again, she says interesting. And Honorable William Clay Senior say, wow, wow, wow. Thanks ever so much. I honestly, greatly, sincerely appreciate. Very educating, excellent. Please, would I like to get your contact. Um, do you want Susan contact? She wanted for the book. We're going to anyway. Um, at, the at the at the end, um, I will give you um, my. I have a website, and you can contact me through the website. Yeah, yeah. And, okay. Or uh, I need to say how beautiful for the first time in their lives, they were experiencing a normal life, but at all, uh, but at yet a great sacrifice to themselves. Yeah. yeah. To themselves and their families. 
All right, all right. I will let you continue, and then we'll continue with the comments later. Okay. All right. So um, I'll just finish up real quickly with Emily's story. Um, there were some individuals who chose not to go to Liberia, and those people ended up staying with uh, Emily in Georgia. And of course, they were still enslaved there. But she kept her promise to them. She provided individual parcels of land for them Isn't to farm. You're a little low. Pardon? You're a little low now. Can you? A little too. Okay. Is that better? Can you hear yeah, me better? I think, yeah, the volume. Okay. Let me turn yes. it up, but then we'll have yeah, this noise still in the low. background. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Okay. Um, she did provide individual parcels of land for them. She equipped them to be independent farmers, and she did pay wages to them. And that you was mean those very, that stayed. That was very unusual at that the, time. Those so, that didn't go to Liberia, you mean? Yes, those who chose to stay in Georgia. Yeah. Um, Anne Randolph Page uh, of Virginia was another prominent white female colonizationist. She was related to George Washington and Robert E. Lee families, and her husband was a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. Now, she was a deeply religious woman, and this is, uh, nope, we don't have a picture of her. Okay. Um, and she supported emancipation, but her husband did not, and he refused to free the family's slaves. So after his death, she arranged for at least two dozen people to migrate to Liberia. <clears throat> she sent a group in 1832 to Monrovia, another group in 1834 aboard the Ninus to Adena, another family in the 1830s to Adena, and a final group aboard the Luna in 1836 to Bassa Cove. In sending off one group, I was so touched by this comment, she said, I yearn to have you in a situation where your children cannot be sold from you. That bitter woe to my view, your children will receive an education there. You will be as a light set on a hill. The eyes of the world will be upon you if you walk worthily. She also offered education and training to her enslaved people. Many of the immigrants she sent to Liberia had trades. They included a shoemaker, a barrel maker, a wheelwright, and a blacksmith. Now, our last photo here is of a woman named Mary Berkeley Minor Blackford. And she was from Virginia. She was characterized as a firm and long tried friend of colonization and as the best known and most active woman in the work of African colonization in Virginia. Mary and her husband both supported colonization, but for very different reasons. She saw it as a step toward emancipation. He saw it as a way to rid Virginia of free black people, and he refused to free the family's slaves. So even though she couldn't accomplish that in her own family, she sort of found another way to contribute. So in 1829, she founded a Women's Auxiliary Colonization Society in her community. She raised hundreds of dollars for colonization and recruited other prestigious women as life members, including Dolly Madison, the wife of US, former US President James Madison. In about 1834, she organized the auxiliary into a group promoting the education of girls, and they helped fund a girls' academy in Liberia. And one more, Margaret Mercer. Margaret was a well-educated woman. I don't have a picture of her. A well-educated woman from Maryland, and she was one of the earliest and most prominent women in the colonization movement. She also taught all of her enslaved people to read and paid for a medical education for one of them to help fulfill the need for medical care in Liberia. She sent at least 14 people to the colony in 1829 aboard the Harriet, the same ship that carried Amelia Roberts and her family. And her many efforts on behalf of the colonization cause were acknowledged when society officials named a ship for her in 1831. Now, many other white women supported the colonization movement in a variety of ways, freeing their enslaved people for migration, 
holding fundraisers, donating supplies, conducting letter writing campaigns, remembering the Colonization Society in their wills, and encouraging others to support these efforts. So this, hang on, this other laptop, I now have it getting powered up again here. And I'm wondering, do you want me to try and, and switch again or just stay on this? I think you'll find here. You think that's okay? All right. Yeah, I think so, but I don't the know. The noise is just there. a little distracting, but that's okay. All oh, right. Oh, um, maybe you were hearing it when I, I'm not hearing any noise anymore. Oh, you're not hearing it? Okay, good. All right, then it's not, if it's not bothering you, that's fine. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, like the black women who went to Liberia, these women also paid a heavy price, but in a different kind of way. Um, when they freed enslaved people, they suffered large financial losses. Um, after freeing her enslaved people, Margaret Mercer started a school that barely paid her bills. She wrote in 1837, I have been in such a state of absolute starvation that I had not the means of getting dinner for my family for one week. Others were socially ostracized or shunned by family members and neighbors. Some even faced threats of physical violence. For example, Anne Page and Margaret Mercer were both labeled troublemakers in their community for their support of colonization. When a woman named Margaret Reed in Mississippi decided to free her enslaved people, a mob comprised of hundreds of armed men showed up at her house and threatened her. Now, sometimes their husbands, sons, or fathers supported the colonization movement and their involvement, and other times they opposed it. There was a man named John Hartwell Cock who was like famous in the colonization movement. He was very, very involved in it. And he in fact had actually been beaten by his neighbors for his views, but he still supported colonization. But when his wife became involved, he objected. He that is the part that confuses me with him. <laughs> yeah, like yeah, he didn't want her right. involved. Um, and he wrote to a friend, we must put down the petticoats at yeah, least as that far would just as their like claim this. to take the platform of public debate and enter into the rough and tumble of the war of words. So to be clear, the white women who supported colonization were not saints, and uh, most of them were not interested in equal rights. Some of them saw emancipation as their own emancipation from the domestic responsibilities of owning slaves. Mm -hmm. But I think regardless of their motivations, it's important to remember that their actions did have an enduring impact on Liberia. And that included freeing people who would become critical workers or leaders in the new republic, building schools, training doctors for the community, and the fact that they advocated so uh, openly their outspokenness may have encouraged other slave owners to free their people as well. Yeah. And so that ended up granting freedom to people who may not otherwise have been free. Yeah. So this discussion and the article that I wrote for the Liberian Studies Journal are limited in several ways. And as I said earlier, I would le love to see somebody else pick this up and do some more research. But um, this, what I've done here is limited in terms of the period that I looked at. So I looked at, um, primarily from the early 1830s to the early 1850s. I also focused mostly on women who were literate and therefore had some kind of historical voice through letters or other means. And of course, these profiles are very brief, you know, they're not in depth. I'd love to see more study on it. And I would particularly love to hear the stories of women who migrated later and the voices and experiences of some of the indigenous women. So um, if you could put up the cover of my book, um, yeah. So this is definitely do that. My book is Liberty Brought Us Here: The True Story of American Slaves Who Migrated to Liberia. This was published by University Press of Kentucky. It is available in hardcover, ebook, and audio editions. And copies can be ordered straight straight from the publisher if you want to order single copies, or you can order them in bulk that way or through Amazon and other online retailers. And it can also be purchased or ordered through US bookstores and libraries. 
And so, oh, and then at the very bottom of this slide, leave it up for a second, um, there is my author website, www.susanelindsay.com. And there's a contact page there. You can just click on that and send me a message. I would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what you guys think of this. So with that, I'll be happy to take questions or comments. Thank you so, 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 so much. I have questions, but I will give the, I will give the audience a um, chance. Um, okay. I'll give the audience a chance. Um, so, Mene, Mene, I'm sorry if I'm not saying your name right. I'm sorry. Uh, he said this program, I don't know, he or she said this program is very educated and interesting. Thank, Thank you, you for your feedback. Um, it, William King said Liberia's strength lies in our history and our unique diverse relationships with America and the indigenous populace. We should not fight this. Instead, we should lean into this uniqueness and strength and we will flourish. No other country on the continent can boast of this or take our place. Thanks, Lindsay and Priscilla. Your research and willingness to share this rich history shows that we are people of substance and great god given strength thank you william for the yes, thank um, you fine um feedback mm, Ozia, Tedu for finances uh, i'm watching for from japan free with belt free will belt and i find this interesting thank you um, good mm -hmm. all the way from japan um flomo i'm avoiding your first name because i don't know how to say it were they in favor, or oh, it's a question, were they in favor or against colonization of black people or black nations? Who Who is it they? Is it a woman? Um, and I hope Susan already, I mean, answer your question uh, at the end, but she can go over that again. So Susan, remember, uh, I think the question is whether women were against uh, colonization of black I, I, people or black nations. Yeah, I think they were in favor of this this particular colonization movement i don't think you can expand that and say that they were in favor of all colonization uh of all black nations mm -hmm. and I, I would like to draw a distinction between the colonization and and the creation of and colonialization the creation of colonies the the american colonization society from the beginning intended that the colony in Liberia would be governed by the people who lived there. And again, this is not a U.S. government agency. It's not the U.S. government taking over a chunk of land to exploit it or, or exploit the resources or the people. This was a private group sending people um, to a place where they purchased land, at least they had the treaties, um, in the hopes that they could set up a colony that they themselves could govern. Um, so I think there's a real distinction between colonializing and colonization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, Anita, how fantastic. Thanks, Anita. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Anita says, so Susan, I'm sure you introduced yourself and spoke of your connection to Liberia. Can you please... Can you speak to that again? How did this come to be a topic for you? Yeah, that was the first question I asked. But yeah. <laughs> um, I actually became interested in this topic um, when I was doing my own family history research uh, in Kentucky. And I discovered that um, a neighbor of my great, great, great grandfather um, was a man named Ben Major. And he is the man who freed some of the people that I write about in my book. And I read just a little piece that he uh, had freed his people and they went to Liberia and that they wrote back and forth for 15 years. They wrote letters back and forth and he sent them tools and seeds and things. And I just thought it was such a compelling story and it, it made me very curious. I wanted to know why he did this, if they survived, what happened to them, did they want to go? And so really, at first, I was only researching this topic out of my own curiosity. And then as, as Priscilla and I discussed earlier, 
I became interested in the, the aspect of the women's involvement because I was discovering that I, it was easy to find information about men or easier, much harder to find information about the women. And many of the sources I used were written by men. And so I, I became curious about the women and what happened with them and what role did they play. Um, so I, so I guess that's how it started. You know, I just, I was curious and I wanted to know more. The research on this took about six years and, um, I researched at the Library of Congress. I researched with newspaper archives. I was able to track down two descendants of Ben Major sisters who were very helpful, gave me a lot of information about their family, um, went to museums and libraries and archives and old cemeteries and attics. And it was a lot of work, but it was also fun. It, it was like putting together a big puzzle to try and find the answers. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, Scott says, Susan, this is excellent. Um, I wish all Liberians are listening. I encourage all Liberians to do their DNA test. <laughs> um, Thank you. Who says, I'm watching from Liberia and I like the impactful insight. My question is, were the ladies who made a Liberian flag immigrants or were they children of some of these women who migrated to Liberia? And was there local or indigenous women at the time who also made impact on the lives of the immigrants? Thanks so kindly for the education and look forward to getting a copy of your book. Uh, thank you, Abraham Morris. Before um, Susan answer you, let me just let you know that we're going to have a guest next Sunday who's going to go more into indigenous and um, the local indigenous women at the time, their contribution and impact on the lives of, um, you know, the formation, all of that and, 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 mm -hmm. and, and immigrants. But yeah, Susan, you can go ahead. Uh, Yes, there. Um, I don't know about all of the ladies who were involved making the Liberian flag, but I do know that at least one of them, Susanna Waring, was uh, the daughter of the woman that I talked about earlier, um, uh, Harriet Waring, Harriet Graves Waring. So she would have been Jane Roberts Waring's sister. And so she was involved and she was involved in the August um, ceremony where they presented that flag to uh, Joseph Jenkins Roberts, who of course was her brother-in-law. Um, so I don't know the details on all of the other women. I have their names somewhere. I don't have them handy, but um, yeah, they were certainly involved with that. Okay, all right, thank you. So next Sunday, we're, we're going to be having Dr. Atimans Gay and he's going to be going more into that uh, the ladies that made a flag and the indigenous and locals so yeah so i hope uh, all of you uh you spread out you will spread the word out and you will join us next sunday um so let's let's just read a little a few more comments and then susan i have a question i'm doing okay. my uh, scott says i'm doing my family history research please let me know if you need help um on this, uh, and I, I would like to say real quickly, um, the families that I write about from Kentucky, their last name was Major and Harlan. Yeah. And so if you know people with that surname in Liberia, I would love to hear from them. Um, so, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it is a very interesting, wow, thanks for bringing attention to this. I think it was when you were answering her, her question about how you decided to look at this subject matter, um, yeah. Let me see. So, let me I have a question. Someone is watching from Dubai. What is Emma? Is it Dubai? Uh, he said, "Good evening to you." Following your phone from United Arab Emirates uh, University. Thank you so much for your information. That's Mohammed Skamara. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, Thank you. Wow, we have a very international group. I'm actually yeah. speaking to you from Portugal. So we have Portugal and Japan and Dubai and all over. And Arizona. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then the studio is in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. But um, I don't know whether it was a comment, but I needed, I wanted you to 
you you had said something was it yesterday or at the no it wasn't yesterday you had said something at the conference that you presented this at the librarian study something or when someone asked the question and so i just want you to to put that out there um uh, and they were like are you saying that these women were all goddesses or doing good on um, treating enslaved people good and and you clarify no of course there were some women who to negotiate with the patriarchy of course they're going to fall in line with what was generally acceptable and expected of them so yes yeah, some of them were harsh and mistreated or, or poorly treated slave and slave yes. people so so i'm not saying all of them were these these great people like emily yes that's like absolutely that. true yes so you might want to put that out there yeah I, you know um i think i mentioned at the end of the presentation these women weren't all saints and uh one of the women who was such an advocate of colonization and really worked hard on it and in the end when the civil war broke out all of her sons fought for the confederacy and she supported them yeah that's so, why so there, yeah, there are these well. contradictions in their behavior that just don't make sense to us um you know i think i think their motivations were really mixed i and that's true for the men as well i think for some of the women um maybe getting that temptation of the slave quarters away from their husband and sons, that was part of it. Um, I think there certainly were men who had fathered children with their enslaved women who sent their own children to Liberia to get rid of the mistakes. Um, there were people who genuinely had a humanitarian motivation. They wanted a better life for people and they realized with the black codes that they could not have that life in the United States, at least not at that point in time. And there were some people who did it out of missionary reasons to, with the idea that uh, enslaved people who had been Christianized would go to Africa and, and preach and evangelize there. There were people who did it for commercial reasons um, since the slave trade, the importation of slaves had been banned, maybe there's another way there, maybe there are other products that the U.S. can get trade with Africa. So I think there were lots of different reasons Mixed why people reasons. did it. And I do think there were some people that it was just plain racism. They just out now didn't want free black, black people. people. So, yeah. you know, I think it, I think that was true for the men and the women who supported it, that there was a real mix of mm -hmm of motivations and they didn't always make sense they were complex and contradictory yeah yeah but i just for some reason i admire emily yes she was young you know to have that kind of heart and mind as a young woman because the husband the guy she married was 28 years older than her and yes when i first started to read that i was thinking okay why do you like besides him most of the slaves in the owners of enslaved people where they will pass on the free of these people in their will to their sons or something and say yes them. and then i'm thinking okay why are you passing on the bulk of the responsibility if you want them to be free why didn't you free them and then there were contentions because some of them when they die they their sons that inherited these enslaved people will be like no i'm not letting them go free i'm not going to be the yes boss. yes will be poor because I want the same money. Uh, but then as I read about Tottenham's husband, uh, then I saw that you had mentioned it. In the state of Georgia, they were they, they, they had this legislation that they weren't allowing people to be free. And it created a lot of bottlenecks. Yes. Um, they couldn't, they couldn't had, stay there if they were freed. Yeah. Even he had offered, I think, so, five thousand or some amount yeah yeah so he they, actually uh in his will he knew about that law yeah. and in his will he offered um ten thousand dollars to donate ten thousand dollars to the university of georgia if the, the georgia ground. legislature would make an exception so yeah. that he could free his people and they could stay there and, and georgia declined refused. they said no yeah. and so after emily worked with the maryland uh, colonization society to free her people that's where that donation went was to the maryland society 
Yeah, so. it was just it was just amazing to me that people are going to refuse an offer that is going to help an entire state, like a university education, yeah. you would think that people are going to accept that, but no, they rather ref refuse that offer yeah. to keep other people in bondage and slavery. Yeah. So that, that, yeah, I thought that was a wow. The, the racism um, was very deep and the uh, greed um, was very deep. And of course, that was the labor force. Uh, in Georgia, if you, if you, in all of the South, if you, were a farmer of any kind or a plantation owner, that was the labor force and mm. people did not want to give it up. Yeah, so so that just that just gives you the kind of um environment with inch with with uh, within which people like um Emily Totman was operating to say I still I'm still going to go ahead to get to do this, you know, yeah to make sure yeah. people if people get their freedom and they decide for themselves whether they want to stay on. Or go to Liberia. And another person yeah. that I admire was the one who taught her for enslaved people who who taught them how to read and write. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and as I said, in most of the South, it was illegal at that time to teach slaves to read and write. There were three Southern states where it was not illegal, and one of those states was Kentucky. And so the the man that I write about in my book who freed his people. Um, taught them to read and write before he freed them, but I think there were I think there were plenty of people doing it even in states where it was illegal, because for I think more than one reason I think they wanted to give people an education and a trade so that they could support themselves when they got there, and they wanted to know what happened to them. And the only way to stay in touch was letters. There was no other way to communicate with them, and so I think there were you know, a couple reasons why people did that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. I, I, I think this, I think, I think this was helpful. And someone has said, thank you to Priscilla and Susan for your research. No, I did not do the research. Susan did the hard work. I just asked her to share it. <laughs> and I'm glad that she shared it. So, yeah. I mean, it just gave us an idea as to, um, you know, what people went through, um, before yeah. yeah before us um, it's hard and those stories are there we just need people who are put in time to investigate them to dig them out especially the ones that have to do with women um yeah. yes yeah hearing about learning about women like elasa hatter a formerly enslaved woman who became a, a you know a teacher and opened a school in liberia yeah um, and like anita say yeah some of them were scared having to go to a new country where you have no connections, you know. Yeah. Um, most of them went there as widows, as single mothers with children. Yeah. Uh, I can't imagine. Them. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah. The woman who had to bury four of her sons, you know, I, as I was reading a story about yeah. her uh, sitting by the, the dead by child and then another guy had to help her to dig to bury yeah. and that was like the fourth child just for malaria i mean what where, where, where does a mother get that kind of strength from to keep growing like i i don't know i don't know and and you know there were so many stories like that there was one family that went on the, the same ship with the um, major and harlan families there was a family named buckner and i think they had seven or eight kids and within a year both parents and like six of the children had died uh, you know, so almost the whole family was gone. And I can't imagine how you keep moving forward with that kind of grief. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. So, I can't. And, it, and they weren't familiar with malaria, so they didn't even know how to treat malaria, how to prevent. Um, no, um, at that time, they didn't understand that, it, no. that they would contract it from mosquito bites. Yeah. Um, they did they figure it out that going out in the evening was yeah. dangerous, but they didn't yeah. connect it to the mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, you know, I do think they probably, I think that's a case where the indigenous people were really helpful to them because I think they probably helped them understand how to stay safer and maybe, you know, had some of their traditional treatments and things that they could help them with. So, yeah. you know, it was um, a rough time. Yeah, yeah, it was. And it, it was also sad 
uh, but then at the same time, I couldn't help. I chuckled when I read that, you know, they would think that catching malaria was coming from staying up late at night. Not like, <laughs> but yeah. then a lot of people will die from malaria. Yeah, if well, you have to yeah. yourself indoors. In and there, there was one man food. who said that it came from eating too much fruits and vegetables. Vegetables, yes. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so we we have like three more minutes. Let me just read a few more comments, and then uh, Susan, you can give us your party. Uh, <laughs> of yeah, um, Jawi can we? Yeah, I said, do you think the purpose of Liberia's founding is actualized? I don't even know whether, but um, uh, hold on to that. Let me just read the other few, then you can. If you want to respond to that, Abraham Morris say, "Here, uh, Abraham K. Morris. Yeah, there's a famous man in Liberia who have an estate in Caldwell with the name Taylor Major. Okay, he's responding to. Um, yeah, Taylor okay. Major, <laughs> I I did reach out to some people that um, through the Liberian Studies Association. Some people had mentioned some of the majors, and I did reach out to a handful of them. I can't recall if he was one of them. But the ones that I reached out to either didn't have any information or didn't want to be a part of the project. So, okay, all right. Um, but thank you, I appreciate that tip. Thank you, thank you, Maurice. Um, Marcus will and Neil Williams say, watching from Pinsley, Dupo Road, Zuba Town, Monovia, Liberia. Thanks, Marcus. Thank um, you, Marcus. Um, JCD, JCD. Treating enslaved people. Uh, I think he's skeptical. Treating enslaved people good. <laughs> it just it, it sounds like it is skepticism. Uh, Anita, I mean, say good to see people are watching from Liberia. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's yes. Good. It's good. Um, um, Scott says, Susan, you can read a book written by Dr. Richard Hall on African shores. That will give you that will give you additional information. Another area of study is the establishment of the Liberian Episcopal Church. Okay, thank <laughs> um, you. Maybe it's how you can do that, and then you and I can talk. Uh, uh, focus on Liberia. Um, Benedict, we are we are hi. Thanks so much. Thank you. Benedict. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah. Well, let, let's just there are a lot of many there are a lot of comments and i don't want them to get on my bike for another show that's coming on soon so uh to say you want to you want to um what um larry david say <laughs> let me resist it. uh i can't resist this one all right i need to say i read somewhere that most people who were in favor of free slave did not want them staying in the united states yeah, and I that is, yeah, that, that, is and, that is generally true. Yes. Yeah. So Larry now says um, the author unfortunately overlooked the role that free African Americans play in their liberation. So uh, Larry, we were trying to, like like the title of the show is we're talking about the role of white and black women. So this is not about the entire liberation. Uh, 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 you know, movement or whatever that happened at that time. We're focusing on the role of women. And Susan did not even cover all of the women, like she mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, like I said to you, next week we're going to have uh, somebody else talking from another perspective. So we're not looking at African-American role. We're looking at women and, you know, we're looking at the role of women. So I hope, I hope you, uh, that helps. Um, it seems difficult. Okay, so uh, Susan, let's uh, let's go give your parting comment. Give your parting comment, Susan. Otherwise, I will keep reading comments. So go ahead and give us your parting comment. I'm I'm pleased to see all the involvement. I'm pleased to see the nice comments and questions from people. It's um, you know, I don't present myself as an expert on all of Liberian history or modern day Liberia. I'm, I'm not. Um, my, my research was focused on this particular era and these particular stories. But in the United States, the story of the colonization of Liberia is not well known. And I really felt like it was important to preserve these stories and to let other people know this history. 
and uh, and I hope it's been helpful to people. I think that that people have most people have enjoyed reading it, and um, I've gotten some really good comments from people that wow, I didn't know this happened. I had no idea that this happened. Um, and in fact, I have had some Liberian people tell me that they didn't understand as much of the colonization movement as I've explored in the book. So um, I appreciate all of you coming and attending this, and I appreciate your good questions. And again, thank you, Priscilla, and Focus on Liberia for inviting me. Of course, of course. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, like you said, uh, there are recorded history tends to focus on the accomplishments and experiences of men, usually white men. Yes. Because even most of what we know, you know, uh, one of our presenters, the presenter of our history channel called Famule, she mentioned that yesterday um, that uh, we tend to, even those who study, tend to focus on the narrative or the perspective or accounts of Europeans. So, yeah. and that's what, and, and those Europeans mostly they can be men. Yes. So that's what Susan is saying here. So that's what we're talking. Um, the the recorded history that we we know about uh, when it comes to colonization, when it comes to early Liberian history, most of them were recorded by men because they were the ones who were typically had the time and who were educated to write history. So it's easier for historians to find documentation of men's life. And this kind of thing kind of erase women's mm -hmm. contribution and their existence. Yeah. That's what yeah. the new day is about. And that's yeah. why we have Susan coming to tell us. So we know this is not an exhaustive history of the from the formation of Liberia. Please, if you have done research or if you have something to share, New Day is about women accomplishment, contribution, challenges, and what everything that affects women. Reach out to me. Let's talk about it. Thank you for staying with us, all of you who stayed on. Thank you. And hope you can join us next Sunday. We'll have Dr. Atimus Gay with us. Thank you so Dr. much. Dr. Gay is wonderful. I've I've heard him speak before. He is. I heard him speak too before, and I have his book. And we've been um, going back and forth with notes on, on next week. So Good. I know it's going to be great next week. So, but yeah, you were also a very great, great, great presenter. Thank you so much, Susan. I appreciate it. Oh, you. you're welcome. You are all welcome. Right. All right. Thank you. All right, folks. See you next Sunday. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. We are Abira. Abira is our home. Abira people. Here you may stay, Abira. Abira, oh. Here you may stay, Abira. Abira, Abira, Abira.